some among them were potentially dangerous. Most were loyal. But no one knew what would happen among this concentrated population if Japanese forces should try to invade our shores. Military authorities therefore determined that all of them, citizens and aliens alike, would have to move. This picture tells how the mass migration was accomplished. Evacuation. More than 100,000 men, women, and children, all of Japanese ancestry, removed from their homes in the Pacific Coast states to wartime communities established in out-of-the-way places. Their evacuation did not imply individual disloyalty, but was ordered to reduce a military hazard at a time when danger of invasion was great. Two-thirds of the evacuees are American citizens by right of birth. The rest are their Japanese-born parents and grandparents. They are not under suspicion. They are not prisoners. They are not internees. They are merely dislocated people, the unwounded casualties of war. The relocation centers are supervised by the War Relocation Authority, which assumed responsibility for the people after they had been evacuated and cared for temporarily by the Army. A relocation center, housing from seven to 18,000 people, the entire community bounded by a wire fence and guarded by military police, symbols of the military nature of the evacuation. Each family, upon arrival at a relocation center, was assigned to a single room compartment, about 20 by 25 feet. Barren, unattractive. A stove, a light bulb, cot, mattresses, and blankets. Those were the things provided by the government. In 1942, the United States government forcibly relocated over 112,000 Japanese nationals and Japanese Americans to remote housing facilities called war relocation camps for the purpose of detainment, re-education, and forced labor. Of those interned, 62% were United States citizens. President Franklin Roosevelt authorized the internment with Executive Order 9066 allowing military commanders to designate military areas as exclusion zones. This power was then used to declare the entire Pacific coast as an exclusion zone, forbidding people of Japanese descent to live within these areas, unless, of course, they were held in war relocation camps. In 1944, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of these exclusion zones, and in 1945, after two and a half long years of imprisonment, the interns were finally released. The United States government issued no formal apologies, but did present each former inmate with exactly $25 in cash and a train ticket home, if they were lucky enough to still have one. Forty-three years later, in 1988, President Ronald Reagan would sign a bill that formally apologized for the internment of Japanese Americans on behalf of the United States government, and finally granted reparations to survivors. The language of the bill stated that government actions of the 1940s internments were based upon three criteria, racial prejudice, wartime hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. So what is most important in this bill has less to do with property than with honor. For here, we admit a wrong. Here, we reaffirm our commitment as a nation to equal justice under the law. In 2001, following the attacks of September the 11th, our government again went into open roundup mode, detaining and imprisoning thousands of United States citizens again seemingly based upon the same three criteria used to intern Japanese Americans race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. Let there be no argument. The United States government has put its own citizens in detention centers. The justifications for doing so range from personal prejudices based upon political and religious grounds to wartime frenzies and fears of future terrorist attacks. In a time of great crisis, the impossible becomes possible. Is it possible that internment camps are being built in the United States today? Is it possible that history will repeat itself? Obama claim 
them the power to keep people in prison indefinitely with no charges against them, no conviction, no sentence, just imprisonment. Well, we used internment camps here in the United States during World War II, uh, and we interned Japanese Americans, uh, or Americans, I should say, to be more correct, uh, Americans of Japanese descent. And these people were cordoned off for the duration of the war. Uh, background checks could have been done. They could have been released or cleared out of those facilities. Uh, but it was thought best because there was so much animosity toward the Japanese for the attack on Pearl Harbor and subsequent deaths of U.S. soldiers that these people just be kept uh, uh, out of sight in one of their detention facilities. On April 1st, 1979, by Presidential Executive Order 12127, the Federal Emergency Management Agency was created for the purpose of coordinating the response to disasters that have occurred in the United States and that overwhelm the resources of local and state authorities. Upon its creation, FEMA absorbed the Federal Insurance Administration, the National Fire Prevention and Control Administration, the National Weather Service Community Preparedness Program, as well as several other federal level preparedness programs. FEMA was also given the responsibility for overseeing the United States Civil Defense, a function which had previously been performed by the DOD's Defense Civil Preparedness Agency. In 2003, FEMA became part of the Department of Homeland Security's Emergency Preparedness and Response Directorate. FEMA follows three simple directives. One, national emergency recovery, two, continuity of government, and three, combating perceived threats to the existing social and political order. FEMA's implicit objective to provide aid to victims of disasters changed under the leadership of President George W. Bush. Although some may argue, prior to the Bush administration, FEMA's reaction time for responding to and the handling of national emergencies was beginning to improve. But in 2003, President Bush would shift the focus of responding to emergencies in America by placing FEMA under the umbrella of the Department of Homeland Security, whose stated objective was and still is to protect our nation from dangerous people. Did the Bush administration's war on terror mentality take priority over the government's emergency response to provide aid to victims during a national disaster? We're fighting evil. And I remember my first words to him were, Mr. President, my estimate is that 90%, 90% of the population of New Orleans has now been displaced. 90%? Yes, sir, I believe it is that bad. That's how bad it is. I really thought that would get just the whole mechanism of the federal government to come charging in. Is once again this mentality that it's a natural disaster. It's a hurricane. It's not Al-Qaeda. The most important job of government is to protect the homeland. In the midst of a searing heat wave, Jefferson County residents lined up in their cars for food and water, wondering what took so long. 